Hello everyone and welcome to today's session. I am Francisca Dinga from the Cavell Group. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we'll begin in, in a minute. Uh, just wanted to let you know a couple of things. Um, we'll be recording this webinar, so if you wish to rewatch it at a later time or share it with your colleagues, you will be able to do so, as we'll be sharing the link with you. Um, also, we'll be sharing a white uh, paper covering this topic, so we'll be able to uh, read more in, in more detail about this uh, topic. Uh, and uh, throughout the webinar, if you wish to ask any questions or at the end, uh, please feel free to do so in the chat um, section of, of the app we're using. Uh, please address these questions to the organizers and uh, we're more than happy to answer them. I will now hand over to my colleague, Mark Demarziak. Thank you. Thanks, Francesca. So, um, hello, everybody. This is Mark Demarziak from the Cavell Group. And I'm happy to be here today and uh, presenting this webinar, um, Unified Communications as a Service, a Business Case for Service Providers, Build, Partner or Acquire. Uh, that's a really catchy title, isn't it? But I think it describes what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about the best way um, that service providers can take UCAS uh, to market in terms of what is the best model to do that. Um, I will be presenting for about um, maybe slightly longer than half an hour. And then I'll hand over to Richard Parker of PCCW Global, who will close off with uh, just um, uh, four or five slides um, talking about PCCW Global's offer. Um, as Francesca said, please uh, do uh, send us questions in the, in the chat and we'll be pleased to deal with them either, either as we go along or we'll keep them till the end, uh, depending on, on the context. So let me just start by introducing very briefly the Cavell Group, for whom I work. So Cavell is a, is, a, is a knowledge business. It is a company that does research in the field of uh, VoIP and UCAS. Um, and it is also a consultancy that works with service providers in terms of helping them take their, their voice solutions to market um, and developing strategies to help them to do that. Um, uh, I am Mark Demarciak, as I've just said, so my background is very much in the, in the ICT industry. Um, most of my career with large corporate vendors like IBM and Cisco. Um, I've also done a stint in market research working for IDC. Um, and um, I also spent a, a very interesting a few years in the Middle East working for a service provider and seeing how how it looks from the service provider side rather than from the vendor side. And the contrast of those two uh, perspectives um, I found absolutely fascinating. And I hope to be sharing some of those, um, those perspectives with you during this, uh, this webinar. So let me just start with a little bit of background. Um, so the ICT industry is at a crossroads. So you know, why is UCAS a hot topic today? Um, and the reason that it is, or one of the reasons, one of the main reasons that it is, is to do with a structural change that is taking place in the ICT industry, where uh, in the old world, uh, companies like my old employer IBM would uh, would sell uh, these very large, very expensive things called computers. Um, they would install them on the premises of the customer, uh, and the customer would then deploy an army of IT people to um, implement and manage that IT infrastructure. And therefore, the, the, the customer, the enterprise, would be saddled with a large capex bill to buy all that kit and would also have to employ a large number of people to make it work and to make it deliver. And what has happened in the last five years or so is the dramatic effect of megatrends like cloud computing, where the, 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 the functionality that comes from IT systems hasn't changed, particularly it's got better, but it hasn't changed. But the model through which enterprises can source that functionality has moved into the cloud. And that means that uh, vendors like, like IBM are suffering. And if you look at the, the major hardware companies in the world and you look at their financial results, you will see that they are really suffering at the moment um, with uh, growth gone completely, and in some cases, many quarters of gentle, steady decline. Um, now, 
that is a um, you know that is a mega trend which is very bad for that part of the industry. However, the customers are still out there and they're still consuming um, IT services and UCAS. Uh, where are they consuming them from? Well, they're consuming them from service providers, and that, if you like, is the essence of this webinar. It is that there is this opportunity out there, in effect, to displace the old way of doing things um, with, with big CapEx budgets and on-premise equipment with a service that comes from the cloud. And the service provider then becomes the, um, the supplier of choice uh, offering the solution as a service. Uh, this book, The Consumption Economics, uh, gives that background and, it, and it's very interesting. There's a reference there to a, a little YouTube video that's, that's worth watching. Um, there's also uh, a free synopsis of this book that you can download from the web. And I think we're sending you that URL, or we've just sent it to you. Um, and this information is also in the um, white paper that you will be sent after this webinar. So that's the context and the background uh, of, uh, of, of the cloud and, and of UCAS. So this is new. Uh, the industry is still in, in its infancy. And what we're going to be talking about in this webinar is what are the opportunities for service providers and how, what is the best way to enter the market? So first of all, what is the opportunity? Well, the opportunity is, is strong and is great. So here is a chart, or two charts um, that come from Gartner. Uh, the one on the top shows the end user spend. So this is enterprises, and SMEs, and, and small businesses spending on uh, unified communications. Um, on, on the red line, that means on premise uh, unified communications. And the green line is the new cloud based UCAS. Uh, um, offering. Uh, the blue line is actually uh, something quite different. It's on-premise support. But you'll, you'll see the trends quite clearly. Is that The on-premise spend is declining and the UCAS cloud spend is increasing and that sometime during 2016, those two lines crossed each other. So that's the great news. Uh, it's not so great if you're a vendor, but it's pretty good if you're a service provider. Uh, the bottom line um, frankly, is even better news because it shows that there are still a huge number of seats of unified communication users out there. So this is not spend. This is the number of, of seats. Uh, a huge number of on-premise PABX, unified communications type systems. Um, and that is gently and slowly declining. Um, and that is history, if you like. That's the old world. Whereas the green line, the, the cloud UCAS line is growing. And what that means is that there's a huge amount of, of addressable opportunity for that green line and for service providers to sell UCAS into this market. So 86% of UC seats are still on premise. And over the next few years, um, most of that is going to be replaced by, by, by cloud offerings. And so this is a large global market. Um, uh, it, it's global in terms of its reach in different parts of the world. And this is the spend on, uh, on, UK, on uh, UCAS. I'm sorry, the title on this, this, um, this chart is wrong. This is the spend on UCAS. And you can see that it's large, not just in North America. It's large in Europe. It's large in growth markets. And it's large in Japan as well. So this is a, an opportunity that is truly global and, and is not concentrated only on um, uh, uh, theatres that are more mature than others. So let's uh, uh, drill down a little bit. I, we've picked Europe um, as a market that we know, we know well, but I think these um, these dynamics would also be applicable to other theatres across the world. So the the top chart there is showing the total number of of cloud communication seats, so UCAS seats per country, and you can see that the UK and the Netherlands are the two largest countries, and that is simply because they are, the, they are the most mature markets and they have the, the largest number of service providers active in this space. What we're expecting to see is that uh, simply because of the size of the economies of France and Germany, that there'll be rapid growth in those two countries as well. Uh, another thing to say about this chart is that whilst you can see that Netherlands is number two in terms of uh, number of seats, 
which means that it must have very, very high penetration, even compared to the UK. If you look on the right hand side of that chart, you can see Belgium, uh, which is very, very small indeed. Now, the Netherlands and Belgium are neighboring countries. They are not exactly the same size, but they're not far away from each other. But what this is saying is that within um, theatres, within geographic theatres, even neighbouring countries will have different dynamics to each other. Um, and that means that when you're addressing these markets, it's important to understand that you can't just make the same offer with the same value proposition, with the same go-to-market in different countries. You really need to know your market, um, your market well. OK, so that was the, the size of the market. So we've just uh, talked about the fact that it's, it's a large market, um, it's, it's lowly penetrated, um, and the individual countries are, have got different dynamics to each other. So what does that mean for service providers, and how can you um, penetrate and access these markets? So um, Cavell has done some analysis and has come up with three fundamental models. There are flavors of these, but the three fundamental um, models to enter these markets are a, or number one, to build and operate your own system, your own technology. Number two, to partner. And there are two flavors of partnering. You can partner with a technology vendor who has got off-the-shelf uh, equipment or, or, or an offering. Um, or you can partner with another service provider, a wholesale service provider um, that will allow you to resell their, their offering. And the third option is actually to acquire uh, another service provider who already has a UCAS offering. And we will be examining these three options and identifying the criteria, the, 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 the pluses and the minuses um, for, for each of these three options, as well as the criteria that should help you to choose. And the reason we're doing this is, is that we what we're observing in the market is countries with different needs and dynamics, uh, but also um, service providers with different skills and capabilities. And therefore, it's important to make the right choice uh, to address this market, which is, uh, you know, a sophisticated, we're talking about a sophisticated, complex technical solution with very specific um, um, go-to-market requirements that go beyond um, um, connectivity. So what are the key criteria that will drive the choice? And I've, I've identified here um, five of the biggest ones. Um, to me, the, the largest one is time to market. Um, time to market is important because this is uh, a, a market with a window of opportunity that needs to be addressed. Um, it's a market in which the um, uh, the uh, opportunities um, are, are are there now, but the ability of service providers to take complex solutions to market, particularly if they're deciding, for instance, to build their own or acquire. Uh, another service provider, this can delay the go to market by months or even years. And um, that is um, a very um, kind of like it, it's a huge barrier to entry to the market. And so uh, it's important then to understand your capabilities, the service provider's capabilities, and the dynamics of the market to make the right choice there. Customer segmentation is important because different customers uh, will have different needs. So depending on the size of the customer, but also depending on their their industry, um, there are big differences there. And this is something we'll come back to near the end of this uh, webinar. Um, there are a lot of solutions out there, um, and therefore it's important to try and differentiate what you do. And differentiation uh, isn't necessarily about finding a, a technology that is different. It might be about branding. It might be about support. It might be about how complete your offer is in, in terms of uh, things like OSS, BSS, and um, you know easy billing and those sorts of things. Uh, cost and margin is obviously going to be there, but the the relative the relative um, costs of the three options, the three models I spoke about on the last slide, um, can can have a, a very large effect on the business case and the um, the p l that you have when you when you're taking these solutions to market and finally um, uh, go to market skills uh, and resources as i was intimating before uh, ucas is a complex solution it's a sophisticated solution that touches end users 
it's not a uh, it's not uh, a piece of uh, of high tech connectivity that um, sits uh, you know uh, in the background humming and users aren't aware of it and, and unless it goes wrong. It's not um, a solution that is sold to an IT organization. This is a solution that is sold to business end users, and they will typically uh, be budget holders in the business, not in IT, and they will typically be uh, much more demanding than an IT department is. And so your go-to-market skills and support resources become very important. And ultimately, um, I think that, that those criteria need to be put into a, a pragmatic kind of framework. Uh, and by pragmatic, I mean the choice of build, partner or acquire. It isn't sort of, well, binary is the wrong word. But you can have a mixed strategy where you can do multiple, you, you, can, you could do several things at the same time. Or indeed, you could have a roadmap where you move from one type of solution to another. And service providers who uh, provide uh, wholesale and white label capabilities can offer um, a much easier and uh, lower risk uh, route to market in that context. And I'll be illustrating that with sort of some examples of uh, of service providers who have gone down these routes um, in a moment. And the other thing to say is that it's easy when you're looking at um, at UC and UCAS to focus on the technology, but when since you are now selling this as a as a service, well, the service is a lot more than simply the functionality of the tool. And as service providers, you know that things like um, billing. Um, billing accuracy, um, billing simplicity, uh, local local regulations and the regulatory environment, uh, language and localization and support. These are every bit as important uh, as far as the the enterprise, the customer is concerned, as the actual solution itself. And that is, I guess, that is a big kind of plus for service providers in this environment. And. How does all that come together? Well, I think it comes together in, in, in one word, which is strategy. Um, selecting and deploying a UCAS solution for a service provider is not a, a sort of small undertaking that sits alongside what it does. It really is quite central to how the company intends to develop, um, uh, how the, the service provider intends to develop, because what, it, what it's able to do when it's done properly is it'll take your existing customers and offer them uh, a much more value-added service that, that, as I said before, touches end users. That makes the relationship between the enterprise and the service provider much more intimate th than it was before and allows the service provider to, if you like, to have much, uh, much longer-term relationships with their clients who really don't want to move. Um, service provider every every time uh, you know that, that, that a new offer comes along because their end users get used to uh, the UCAS solution that they're using. Uh, that means that your internal skill pool becomes very important. Are you able to do this yourselves or do you need to work with somebody else or acquire somebody else? Uh, your fiscal imperatives, your finance organizations will look very, very differently at an acquisition than they would do um, a partnership contract. Um, they will also, your senior management will look at the risk of uh, this kind of uh, venture and your ability to manage that risk. And the, the, the final area there is something I'll come back to, which is that the, there is a, a growing trend to support multinational SMEs and enterprises. And that may take some service providers out of their comfort zone where they are used to dealing in one country with one set of regulations, and here they have customers who are actually asking to be supported in multiple multiple countries. Okay, so that is, if you like, the strategic view. Now let's um, spend a minute here looking at what other service providers have done um, in this in when making these choices. And you can see here the names of some pretty big and pretty uh, pretty chunky service providers um, in the market. So um, Verizon, for one, is, a, is, a, is, is, a, is an interesting one. In the US, uh, for their US uh, customers, they, they have selected a, a broad cloud solution um, and they launched that successfully. 
with that experience and knowledge, when they decided to launch UCAS outside of the US, well, they decided to build their own platform, build their own um, customized platform. And so they're offering two separate, fully functional uh, UCAS um, services in, in, in different geographies based upon their analysis of what their customers need and their, their deployment and support capabilities. Daisy, as a UK service provider, uh, who, was, who entered the market uh, by, uh, by reselling, by acquiring a broad soft platform and delivering that as a service, well, they decided actually to discard that and to move to BT Wholesale. Um, and there were various strategic reasons why they did that to do, to do with, with support, to do with, um, with their internal capabilities. But ultimately, they chose BT Wholesale, uh, even though they compete in the market with BT. And I think that's illustrative of the fact that this is, you know, this is, this is not a linear, very simple uh, market here. This is where uh, competitors need to, need to work with competitors where that's appropriate. Um, a, uh, a major uh, service provider uh, uses uh, a, a, an off-the-shelf um, solution from a vendor um, in the US, but actually found that when they wanted to move outside the US, the complexity of supporting um, UCAS in multiple theatres all over the world um, made them choose to partner with PCCW. So they uh, white label, um, sorry, they resell a white label offer from PCCW uh, and are able then to leverage the, the support and the geographic reach of PCCW across the world. Um, BT Wholesale, coming back to them, uh, originally had a HIPCOM um, platform um, which they used to get to market fast, um, but they then uh, have invested in building their own platform um, internally in, in the UK. So you can see here that there's many different models um, and there is no reason why you can't move from one model to another depending on the business um, imperatives. Before I move on, I'll just mention that little blue box in the bottom there, the Skype for Business uh, box. So Microsoft, you know, is clearly a very powerful vendor in this environment and is offering its, its, its services um, to service providers to resell. However, it has recently decided to uh, enter the market themselves and sell um, this cloud PBX solution uh, direct uh, to enterprises in competition with their own channel. And that is just disrupting the market. I think it's confusing some of the market. And whatever your strategy for UCAS is, um, there has to be a chapter in your business case called Microsoft. And what is, what is your, your stance in terms of working with them or, and or competing against them simultaneously? So that's some examples of what's happening out there in the market. Now let's come back to these three key options I was mentioning earlier, um, the build and operate, the, the, the two flavors of partnering and the acquisition route. So over the next few slides, I'll be looking at the pros and cons of these options. Um, we don't really have time to go into great depth on these, but the white paper that you will receive will have more analysis and deeper analysis into these, these options with the pros and cons of each. So today I'm just going to run through them relatively quickly and you'll see that the, 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 they are uh, all quite different from each other. And even the two partnering options, although they, they, they have similar pros, um, the cons are, are quite different. So let's start with option one, which is build and operate. Now, the pros there uh, are, are pretty obvious, is that if you, you're going to build a solution, well, you're, you're going to design that solution to, to fit you and to fit your market. Um, and it, by definition, if you build your own, it'll be unique, it'll be proprietary, um, and it'll, it'll be differentiated from the market. It'll be under your control. Um, in terms of cons there, well, I'd say that uh, building uh, complex IT systems isn't necessarily a core competency of some service providers. So, some have got that capability, many don't. And uh, IT, complex IT development, uh, software development is complex and risky. Um, it can be lengthy, therefore your time to market, I was mentioning earlier, might go up. 
you are then burdened with the um, the job of of maintaining that solution, which requires many resources, and uh, your go to market is going to be entirely up to you. So you will need either to hire a consultant or you will need to develop your go to market yourself. So let's compare and contrast that with option two, which is partnering with the technology vendor. And so the, the two contrast quite heavily. Um, in terms of pros, because you have an off the shelf solution from a vendor, your time to market will be much shorter. Um, your resourcing needs will be much smaller because you're sourcing um, that, that support from the vendor. Um, the solution will always be up to date because it comes from the vendor. He will, he will make sure that it's current. And normally vendors will offer you free or fee go to market collateral and support. Um, so that makes your go to market simpler. From a negative point of view, well, you're working with a vendor um, and you're tied to that vendor's solution. And one thing I have to say, having worked on both sides of the fence for a vendor and from a service provider, the, the kind of the philosophy is different. Vendors like transactions. They focus heavily on their own technology solution. And their concept of service provision is a little bit different from that of a service provider, which is something I'll come to in the next slide. Um, and what that means in terms of, of service is that they typically are a lot less interested in back office, OSS, BSS, billing, um, numbering, and so on. And so the solution that they offer might not have all of those components integrated. And so there is some potential complexity around that. The next option, which is partnering with another service provider, has got many of the same pros as partnering with a vendor. So time to market, resourcing, um, go to market support. In addition, you have this kind of like more holistic and more complete solution where a service provider will understand, um, you know, your supplier will understand things like OSS, BSS, security, fraud detection, uh, and will be able to offer potentially a more complete service with handsets, um, MPLS, etc. So this solution from a service provider might be um, more complete than one from a vendor. From a, from a negative point of view, well, you're not working with a vendor now, you're working with a service provider, so potentially you are one step removed from the vendor that might make technical support and the leverage of support from that vendor a little bit distant. And the financial model, well, you're, you're, you're essentially, you're reselling an off-the-shelf solution which means that you're essentially you're operating uh, a margin which is back to back and that margin might get squeezed. And I'm sorry, I missed that from option 2A, the partnering with a vendor, which is the same. And finally, um, a little bit like um, Daisy and uh, um, BT Wholesale, potentially you could have a competitive conflict with another service provider if they're active in the same theater as you are. So those are the, the partnering options. The final option um, that I mentioned earlier is acquisition. And acquisition is, is a little bit bipolar in that the pros are very pro and the cons are, are relatively con, put it that way. So the pros are that, well, you're acquiring um, a, a business that is currently operating. It's got market presence. It's got customers. It's got an existing revenue stream. And therefore, that is uh, kind of like a, a kind of seamless um, uh, value proposition where you're taking that all of those uh, benefits and you're extending them. However, um, I don't know if any of you have been involved in merger and acquisition activity, but it is, um, I don't know what the, ad the right adjective is. I think painful might be the one that I would use, having been involved myself. Um, it's not a core competency of most service providers, not all. I mean, some do this continuously, but most don't. And it's very complex and risky. And I've come across probably more um, failed M&A activities where the failure is actually not the fault, um, not under the control of either party in the, in the exercise. Um, and having acquired 
uh, another service provider well integrating the operations of that service provider into your own operations can be uh, can be tricky and can be a nightmare and finally from a financial point of view a fiscal point of view your finance people will look uh, long and hard and crawl over any deal like this because typically these are large transactions um, and therefore the the amount of due diligence that's re required is really significant so those were the the, the three three and a half options um, sort of looked at briefly from a pro and con point of view um, just a few words um, before we close on some of the other market dynamics that can help differentiate um, and drive your value proposition. Uh, the first one I've mentioned before, which is this idea of multinational, of serving multinational customers, which is actually potentially a lot less scary than it, than it sounds. Uh, another option is verticalizing the offer. And because you're talking about um, uh, a, a system or a solution that touches end users, well, those end users in different verticals will have will have different requirements. And then finally, the concept of adding features to uh, a UCAS solution. So let's just look at these three areas quickly. Um, the multinational angle. So you can see here two charts. The one on the left is uh, EU countries, the number of EU um, uh, uh, com uh, companies that have affiliates, have subsidiaries in other countries in the EU. And the one on the right is where they have affiliates in the USA. And you can see there are a lot of companies that, 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 that operate in more than one country. And we're not just talking about um, enterprises here. We're also talking about mid-market companies. And the key here is that the, the trend that we've observed, that Covella's observed in the market, is that whereas previously, when UC was on-premise, or, or companies use PBXs, each, each affiliate, each subsidiary in different countries of, of a company would source their voice solutions and their PBXs and their UC and their voice service providers locally within that country, whereas all their IT systems tended to be centralized and provided from the center. What we're seeing now is a migration from those on-premise PBX devices and multinational companies, even mid-market ones, are now looking to source uh, their voice solutions centrally as well. And that creates an imperative, but also an opportunity for service providers to be able to do that and to offer one contract globally or regionally uh, to, their, to their customers for UC. So that's um, multinational opportunity. Verticalization I mentioned before. And this is a growing trend, which is still not very, uh, not hasn't penetrated the market very much. So most on-premise UC and UCAS solutions are vanilla. There is no vertical focus for them. So you know, a, a phone is a phone is a phone is kind of the, uh, the, the 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 vernacular there. However, what we're seeing is that there are verticalization opportunities, where, for instance, um, in uh, retail and hospitality. There are some specific requirements that, that hotels might have. Um, in banking, there are very specific requirements, uh, especially around things like um, security and compliance. Uh, and so there are opportunities here to start to differentiate uh, what is a, you know, the same solution, but uh, marketed and maybe configured in a slightly different way. The final area I wanted to touch on was, was, was adding features and feature value add. So uh, the chart here shows what, based upon our research, what the most popular services demanded by UCAS customers are. So over and above simple, simple voice telephony, um, there is mobility, there is contact center, handsets, analytics, team collaboration, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important because the richness of the offer, the more of these features that you are able to offer to your customers, the more attractive the overall offer is, but also the stickier it gets. And by sticky, I mean that when a customer is sourcing his telephony, his contact center, 
his analytics and his team collaboration from one service provider, it's going to be very, very difficult and painful for them to move from that. And so you end up with longer term, more profitable relationships with your with your customers. And we are now getting um, inquiries from service providers around who they should be partnering with to offer these kinds of services or what kind of solutions they should be acquiring to add richness to their to their voice switch. Now, another angle of this, of adding features, is actually, well, to offer these features um, as a paid for service. So in increasing the richness of the offer, but also at the same time, helping to increase your ARPU. Now, this uh, slide, the, 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 the diagram on this slide has got uh, for the different types of value added service, so analytics, call recording, team collaboration, etc. Well, what is the split between a bundled for free in terms of the blue columns and sold as a value added service in terms of the purple column? And you can see that there are quite a few services that tend to be value add. And what we see in Cavell is an increasing opportunity to offer. Um, bundled services that generate increased ARPU and add value to customers. And just one little anecdote here, from an analytics point of view, um, we are finding that micro businesses with, with, with three or four or five employees are now starting to ask for analytics to understand how these systems are being used. So we've done, I think, a, a, a whistle-stop tour through the world of, uh, of UCAS. Um, this is my final slide. So just to, to summarize, um, the market opportunity, we, we looked at it. It's large, um, it's latent, and there is a lot of, of, um, of opportunity because penetration is low. Uh, we believe in Cavell that the UC market will largely shift to the cloud in the years to come. Um, it offers higher ARPU and more sticky, rich relationships with your customers, um, and it is a is a is is a strong and powerful uh, value proposition for service providers going forward. However, achieving it is you know as ever there are barriers to to being able to achieve it, technical and go to market risk and complexity, uh, the demands of customer support because you're now talking to end users, you're not talking to IT departments. And that makes the imperative of choosing the right operating model um, really, really critical. So going it alone, building your own, uh, partnering with a, a vendor or a service provider, or indeed finally acquiring uh, an, uh, a service provider who already has a UCAS solution. So uh, everything that I've said is going to be expanded on in the white paper that you're going to be sent. Um, what I'll do now is I'll hand over to uh, Richard, who is going to take us through the few slides on um, PCGW uh, Global's um, solution. Okay, thanks a lot, Mark. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, thanks for that. So, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for, for joining today. Um, so, I'm Richard Parker. I head up the business development activities within PCCW Global for Unified Communications and Collaboration. And just to give you a, a very quick overview of PCCW Global, for those of you who don't know us, uh, we are uh, one of the top 10 network providers, IP network providers in the world. Uh, all of that is based upon a, a bunch of, of different carrier partner relationships. So basically, the, the foundation of what we do is a a global relationships business. Uh, we have presence in 140 countries, and we have one of the top 10 IP networks globally, as I mentioned, and we've attached three UCAS platforms to that IP network, one in North America, one in Europe, and one in Asia Pacific. So we're very much in the 2B uh, type of offering that Mark uh, spoke about earlier on. So we're the service provider model offering unified communications as a service across that infrastructure. So what we're seeing today is enterprises are looking for a single provider globally, very much in the way that IT systems have been rolled out 
globally across a single organization uh, from a central point of control. We're now starting to see that type of behavior in the unified communications, the collaboration type uh, products that and solutions that enterprises are, are looking to, to purchase at the moment. Basically, we're looking for one single relationship, sort of one easy point of contact as well. They're looking for that consistent experience wherever they're accessing and through whichever means of accessing the service. So basically what we do is facilitate a global offer for unified communications, allowing our resellers, our global partners to capture revenue uh, for a worldwide service, whether that's in a, a new market that you wish to enter as a, a wholesale white label type reseller, or whether that's uh, a an offer to customers in your home market who require service in other countries. So what's driving this behavior? So UCAS is currently experiencing growth throughout the, the various business segments, uh, what we're seeing is the, the fastest growth in the, the mid-range um, segment. So the, the medium-sized businesses where we're starting to see more and more multinationals uh, adopting cloud-based telephony, cloud-based communication systems. With that, with that medium-sized business comes more multinationals as i said and the need to serve those globally is becoming more and more prevalent in order to fully compete in that segment of the market so that isn't an easy thing to do um we as i said are a global service provider we are are, are a company that has hundreds of different carrier partners and I would be lying if I said that rolling out and expanding these services globally is a, a simple task. It's not, not by any means. Uh, there's a, a lot of different moving parts to one of these services. Um, and one of the main barriers, obviously, to this type of service is regulatory side of things. So all of your numbers, your portability, the different regulatory compliance elements that change from country to country, from region to region, uh, customer data, things like that. All of those things need to be deployed on a, a market by market basis. So, and, and that's before you even get into considerations around local knowledge and cultural differences and, and having the capability to support these customers uh, locally uh, in, their, in their service. So basically, we've got our, our three different options, as, as Mark mentioned. And so we just go on to the next slide. We see we've got the, the possibility to build by our partner, uh, as Mark ran you through already. So I won't labor the point. Um, but basically, we've got two high risk and high cost options, which give you total control and flexibility of what you want to take out to market. However, it's very, very slow to enter market by market. Um, there's, again, the high risk and high cost element of rolling out a platform in the market, ensuring that it's resourced properly to, to support and maintain the service. Um, or we have the option, which is the one that we're offering, which is to partner and go to market much more quickly. Uh, and to be able to just have a single relationship to, to take out that global offer. So relationship, you can grow as we expand our offer and, and within ship, you get all of the, the things that come with a, a single single service, which is single customer experience, a turnkey set of tools and capabilities that allow you to take out a service that is, is um, consistent across the world. So whether it be um, in Asia, Europe, the Americas, Africa, we can manage all the different currencies, the languages, the localization. But most of all, we provide all of that to our reseller partners to be able to 
monetize and sell very, very quickly in each of those new markets. So basically, rather than looking at the, the blue line of upfront investment, hiring resources in local countries, and being able to, to push out an offer um, through your own means, is each market becomes much, much more rapid to, to monetize and the acceleration of the return on investment that comes along with that, um, the de-risking uh, of rolling out to each market. Basically, you almost have the option to just try out a new market with minimal upfront investment, minimal risk, um, and you can get rapidly uh, profitable services in markets that, that you require. So we then offer a set of downstream options where you can then pull service in-house if you wish to build it yourself down the road with minimal disruption to your customer base uh, using our, our own tool set that you can then take in-house uh, provides you with those downstream options so you're not um, stuck on a single path uh, for the service to, to its termination. You're all, you have downstream options all the way through when you hit a critical mass and you feel it makes sense to pull that in-house we can provide you with everything you need uh, in order to, to do that, to perform that transition. So that's everything from me. So thanks everybody for, for listening uh, and back over to you, Mark. Great, thanks very much, Richard. Uh, we're getting a couple of questions in here. Um, one question is actually related to this chart, Richard, which is the, the timeline. So um, I, I know it's, uh, it's a difficult thing to, to be able to say, but what is the kind of um, of length of that time between contracting with PCCW and being able to go live with a, with a service? Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, so I guess it partly depends on on where we are in in the relationship. So, so if we we're talking about a, a full white label reseller type um, or arrangement, then we're probably talking about Two to three months from from contract signature to um, to fully um, uh, gather requirements to be able to to configure, take that service out, test it, set up all the connectivity between um, our platform and the local networks. So yeah, two two to three months I think for that initial connectivity testing. But then once that is in place, being able to roll out new markets is is much more rapid. Uh, so a, a new market that we have um, or service already in is a matter of, of one to two weeks. Um, and we, we've even managed to, to provide service in a, a new market where in, in Africa where we didn't initially have service um, in a matter of, of, I think it was less than a month, we managed to do it in. So, so it can be very, very quick. Um, partly depends on, on which markets we're talking about. But if it's markets where we already have service, we can expand offers within a week or two. Okay, thanks Richard. Um, we're getting a, a couple of other questions. There was a question about the, the Gartner research, which was showing 18% growth. Um, and I, uh, I think there's probably a typo in the slide because we, we've gone back to the, uh, the Gartner data and it is growth between 18 and 20%. So I must have made a typo in that, in that slide. Um, Skype for Business is another question, um, which is about uh, whether Microsoft was defocusing and focusing on Teams. Um, uh, absolutely right. So Teams is the new brand name that they are adopting. Um, we, uh, in Cavell, we're actually, um, it's, it's the one vendor that is very, very difficult to read and to understand exactly where they're going with this solution. Um, what they seem to be doing seems to be illogical at the moment in terms of creating this channel conflict. Um, but they're so big um, that they really can't be ignored. So I think that is, a, that is I think, why I said that in any go-to-market uh, business case, there should be a chapter called Microsoft, which is about either defining how you're going to work with them or how you're going to compete with them, or quite possibly how you're going to do both at the same time. Okay, um, are there any further questions before we close this session? Uh, 
right. So I'll I'll I, I'll take that as a no. So I'd like to thank you all very much uh, for joining us uh, today on this uh, on this call on this webinar. I hope you found it um, interesting. Um, as I said before, you're going to be receiving the white paper, which is the narrative version of the presentation that we've um, that we've given you today, uh, which has got more information and has got those references to that of that book uh, about the disruption of the industry that I mentioned. So with that, I would like to say thank you very much and um, have a good day. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.